start in two minutes time. The webinar will start in one minute's time. Okay. Computer audio or phone port for computer, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you, you don't need, you, you need to be muted though. So do I do that? Uh, no, press that green. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Start in two oh, minutes time. Minutes time. in two minutes time. Good morning everyone, my name is Sarah Doherty and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Hornbill. I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar where we will be having a presentation on simplifying the challenges of modern ITSM with Hornbill Service Manager with Manish Dave, Relationships Manager and Connor Hamilton, Product Specialist here at Hornbill. Just to inform you, Delegate Auto will be muted during the presentation to help facilitate flow and timekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the GoToMeetings question facility on the right-hand side of your screen. We will collate questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to attend. I will now pass you over to Manish and Connor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Myself and Connor will be taking you through an overview of Hornbill Service Manager and how we've helped simplify the challenges of modern service management. To begin with, I'll be looking at some of the key challenges we've identified and addressed in our new solution. Connor will then take you through a demo of Service Manager in action, and I'll close by looking at our commercial offering, some of Hornbill's key differentiators, and our support works to Service Manager migration package. So to begin with, Hornbill have been in the ITSM industry now for over 20 years, supplying support works, the system all of our attendees are using today. We've looked at the feedback our customers have given us over the years and our experience in the industry to identify a number of key challenges, not just with support works, but with other traditional ITSM software that's out there. The number one challenge we hear about all the time from our customers is upgrades. They're an expensive, time-consuming process that can be quite painful. Customers often tell us that they plan on upgrading support works, but for one reason or the other, the project gets delayed. And before you know it, there's a wide gap between the version you're on to the latest version, causing a more complex, costly upgrade project. So this is an area we've really tried to address and improve on in Service Manager, and we'll show you how shortly. Customization. The reason a lot of our customers bought support works in the first place is because it is so customizable. But the more you customize the solution, the more difficult it becomes to support. And going back to my first point, upgrade, because those customizations often need to be re-implemented at the point of upgrade. So again, we really tried to make life easier in Service Manager, and we'll show you how shortly. 
ITSM is a complicated enough topic at the best of times without having a complicated solution behind it. Support Works is very feature rich and powerful, but it does require a high degree of knowledge and expertise. This can lead to training, which can be time consuming and costly. Another situation we often hear about is where customers lose their support works administrator for one reason or the other, and it leaves a gap in knowledge on their service desk because their replacement does not understand the software. So again, another area we really try to improve on in service manager. So again, support works is very feature rich and powerful, but I'm sure you'd probably agree that if you compare it to the type of apps we use outside of the office, it's not particularly intuitive by today's standards. For the most part, communication actually happens outside of support works. So you'll be logging tickets within support works, but you'll be asking questions of colleagues to help you resolve those tickets, whether it's an instant message or an email or a conversation. But that communication is not stored anywhere. It's not reusable. And this is an area we really try to tap into in Service Manager, and I'll come on to that shortly. So all of what I've mentioned leads to a high total cost of ownership with upgrade costs, with consultancy, with training. The hidden cost you might not think about, such as the infrastructure cost to host a server, like the electricity costs. And we're all looking at ways to make our spending more efficient. So Hornbill had a light bulb moment where we looked at the feedback our customers have given us over the years, and we looked at how the world has changed with the mobile and cloud revolutions. And we use that to create a collaboration platform that allows your colleagues and teams to engage in a much more modern, intuitive way, where information that matters to you comes to you. On our platform, various apps are available. Today we'll be focusing on Hornbill Service Manager, but there are other line of business apps that we'll be looking at, including Document Manager, Customer Manager, and Configuration Manager. Now, these applications can work stand standalone or side by side to leverage each other. We've really tried to innovate by marrying best practice service management with familiar social and consumer mobile concepts to create a system that lets you share knowledge and ideas, collaborate no matter where you are, getting more done in less time and from anywhere. You can work across any device. This is all browser based. We also have native iOS and Android applications. You can work from anywhere with language no longer a barrier. So I mentioned earlier, for the most part in support works, communication actually happens outside of the tool. So what I mean by that is you'll be logging a ticket within support works, but you'll be asking questions of your colleagues to help you resolve that ticket. So it might be an email, it might be a conversation, it might be an instant message. But that communication with your colleagues is not stored in support works. It's not reusable. And that's an area we refer to as tacit knowledge, knowledge that's difficult to document. And we really try to tap into that in Service Manager, and we'll show you how shortly. Tacit knowledge is in contrast to explicit knowledge, which would be the types of structured knowledge that you'd store in a knowledge base, such as FAQs, policies, procedure documents. And again, we really try to focus on this area and make it a lot more intuitive and user-friendly, and we'll come onto that shortly. So before we begin, begin the demo, just a very key, key point. SupportWorks is a traditional piece of on-premise software. What that means is Hornbill will release a new version. You download it, you test it. If you're happy with it, you download, you deploy it to a live environment. But the point being, you have to stop what you're doing in order to carry out that upgrade. Service Manager, on the other hand, is delivered as a true service. We use continuous deployment to keep you up to date all of the time with the latest features. Similar to Facebook or Google, you don't stop what you're doing in order to upgrade. You're just presented with the latest features all of the time. So what that means is there are no more complex and costly upgrades. All updates are automatic. So you're always up to date with the latest features without any service disruption and customizations that keep on working guaranteed. So on that note, I'll pass you over to Connor to take you through Service Manager in Action. Thank you very much, Manish, and good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas, of course. Um, I've got three different portals to show you this morning. Um, I don't know if you've seen it before. I'm going to start with the self-service portal. I'm going to flip across to the analyst portal and then to the administration portal. Any questions at all, feel free to put them into the webinar chat session, and we will respond to them at the end. Uh, so this is the self-service portal. <clears throat> we support single sign-on. And all of the colors, all of the texts, all of the images, you can customize to look and feel however you want to. Um, I'm signing in as a gentleman called Steve. 
and Steve is using the portal as his one-stop shop. I say one-stop shop because uh, service manager is equally at home in facilities or finance, or let's have a look at the list here, uh, finance or HR, people services, that kind of thing. Um, the benefit of the customer is he can use this, as I say, to request anything from anywhere in the business. Uh, all the services that the customer is subscribed to are shown under the All My Services tab. Each customer logging in may have a completely different view depending on the subscriptions that the service desk have given that particular customer or that group of customers. Uh, and as you can see here, we have uh, clear icons, uh, a bit of text in which, we, which we can expand if we want to. Uh, we have the bulletins flashing across the top. Uh, the idea of these is just to let the customers know of uh, the current state of play before they get in touch. So if I have a quick flick through, we can see there is an issue with that particular service. Uh, our supplier is currently investigating and we will update shortly. So before Steve gets in touch about uh, something to do with Link, the service disk have let him know that they are aware there is a particular issue with that particular service already. Um, we have a couple of icons next to some of these services. These are dependent on the current state of play. The one on the top left is to show that particular service is currently impacted. And as you can see, we can put messages underneath those icons. And the icon on the right is to show the number of active requests that the logged in user has against that particular service. Uh, so we can see those per service, but we can also see all of the requests against all of those services under the All My Requests tab. Uh, and obviously, if there are impacted services, the impacted tab will appear. If there are active requests, the active tab will appear. And if the logged in user wants to, they can set up their favorite services, which will be first and foremost when they first log in. If the user is unsure where to go, there is the federated search in the middle of the page there. So the user can search through everything that the logged in user is currently subscribed to. Uh, so in this case, if Steve wanted to request a new mobile, they can type in mobile and it will come back split out into FAQs, catalogs, requests, and services. Again, just to keep it as simple as possible for the end user. So as I mentioned, if Steve wanted to request a new mobile device, he can simply click on the relevant catalog item, and that will go in and ask the relevant set of questions, or whichever set of questions you guys need to be able to deal with that particular request. Uh, if Steve does know where to go, let's take a hypothetical situation. Steve is working from home today. He is trying to connect to the VPN and cannot. So he's gone as the self-service portal. Obviously, this is accessible anywhere, anytime. And he can see from the bulletins, there is a service availability issue with the VPN access at the moment. It's currently impacted. There's an issue with our VPN client. There's more information available here. So you can click on the bulletin itself. and That will go into the service. There is some more information at the top. We can see it's impacted, and we have four tabs available to us. Uh, I'll start from the right, and that one is a known issue. So because the service desk are aware that there is a known issue with this particular service. They have published a workaround to the self-service. So Steve, in this case, is having an issue connecting to the VPN. He can come onto the self-service. He can look, see the workaround, give it a go, and hopefully that will fix his problem and he'll be able to go about his day. He can still let the, the service desk know that he was impacted by that particular issue by clicking the Me Too button on the right-hand side here. That will add Steve as a connection to this existing known issue. So Steve doesn't have another ticket to log. The service desk have one less ticket to manage, and yet Steve will be included on any communication about this uh, service availability issue, and the service desk will be able to report how many users were affected by this particular issue. Uh, as Manish mentioned, we can publish FAQs to the self-service, so this is the uh, explicit knowledge, um, and this can take the form of texts, videos, hyperlinks, uh, whatever you want, basically. Uh, any active requests that the logged in user has against that particular service is shown under the request tab. And if Steve still wanted to uh, log a ticket, he can. Um, in this case, this particular service has been split out into three catalog items. Each one uh, is, is quite clear on, on what it's for. So uh, the ITIL jargon is, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it's an incident or request. In this case, Steve has a VPN access issue, so I just click on the relevant catalog item. And as Manish mentioned, uh, we try to keep this as simple as possible for the end users to be able to get in touch with the service desk. So it's one question at a time. We have the breadcrumb trial on the right-hand side, and it's a decision-based system. So in this case, we have a VPN access issue. What is the issue you're experiencing? Let's say it's connection refused. Next. 
then we were asked, do you have internet access? What's the error message? Any supporting information? And obviously the question we were asked in the first step and the answer we gave is there on the right hand side. We can flip back on the breadcrumb trail or we can hit the previous button. So just to show you the decision based system, if I select the other option, we were asked a different set of questions. So in this case, uh, I'll fill it in. Hopefully you get a bit more detail from your customers. Cannot connect and contributing factors and we can put highlighted text have you checked your broadband connection uh, and nope there's no issues with broadband thank you very much we can import assets from various sources um, this can be a scheduled import and once they're in we can link them directly with customers so in this case on the self-service Steve is presented with the assets that the system thinks are linked directly to him so a VPN access issue, it might be something to do with Steve's laptop, but if Steve wanted to log a ticket for a shared asset, like a printer, for example, that wouldn't be linked directly to him, uh, he can search through the CMDB to find that particular asset. So we hit finish. Uh, it'll come back with a reference number, 217, and we've prefixed IN for incident in this case, but you can prefix that with whatever you want. If I pin that at the top there, we can see the heads-up display. We're already on the second stage, even though we've just logged it. It's already been assigned to the first line support team uh, and an email confirmation has already been sent to Steve with the reference number and the details and we can see we're on the second stage to investigate this particular issue and the customer needs to accept it. So Steve will be able to come onto the portal to see an update for his particular request at any point without needing to bother the service desk. Uh, so you guys can focus on the things you need to focus on. All of the details that Steve has logged are all shown with collapsible panels underneath the, the details all on the one page, there's no flicking between tabs, uh, nice and simple to navigate for the end user. Uh, if Steve wants to update, he can post, it, uh, post in the update there and that will go to the timeline in chronological order. And again, attachments, you can go drag and drop or go the old fashioned way, uh, uploading a document. But as you can see, nice and nice easy for the customer to get in touch. Uh, the final thing that I wanna show you on the self-service portal is this colorful character in the bottom right. Um, just in case you don't like that color of character, you can change the image, you can change the colors, you can change the text. But this is live chat. This is a brand new application. And if Steve, for example, he has just logged a ticket, but if he has something else that he wants immediate assistance with, you can click the start chat button and that will go away and say, please wait while you connect you with an agent. So I'm going to flip across to the analyst side now. And I'm logged in as a gentleman called Graham. Uh, this is Graham's news feed. This is what each analyst will see when they first log in, but I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later. Um, I just want to point out the notifications first of all. Steve, uh, sorry, Graham is part of the first line support team, so he has a notification to say that incident we just logged on the self service has been assigned to Graham's team. So we can click straight into it there if we want to. Uh, and the chat session that we just initiated on the self service portal is also shown there, and again, we can click straight into it if we want to. Uh, Graham can pick these up on his phone on his uh, via email or from within the application uh, it's completely up to each analyst how they want to receive those notifications <clears throat> on the left hand side we have the chat icon and we can see that there's one chat session waiting for us right now so if I click on that uh, this is the chat session that Steve has initiated on the portal so if we open up that chat session uh, we can see the customer we can see the details when it's created when it was updated and the participants at the moment uh, and as it says we must accept the chat session before posting a message so I'll pick this one up and from there we have pre canned responses again it's completely customizable you can uh, say whatever you want there and I'll say hi how can we help Oops. send that and then uh, Steve on the self service portal can pick that up, he can make that full screen, close it however he wants to, and from there, if I get the uh, snipping tool, we can drop in attachments, or we can take a screenshot, so let's take a screenshot of that particular process, and paste it straight in, and say, uh, I am seeing this. So from there, they go straight into the live chat, and again, Graham can pick it up on the other side and see exactly what Steve is seeing. Graham can then respond, paste his own screenshots, write his own attachments. Uh, if I mark this particular one as solved, the metrics here on the right-hand side, uh, the response time, the close time, uh, they're all stored in the database, and they can then be reported on so you can see the average response time and the average close time for these live chat sessions if you want to. 
so that's the live chat application. As I mentioned, that is new. Uh, we, we do also have the ability to turn this into a uh, request if you want to. Uh, so I'm going to flip across to the services now. Now, these are all the icons that you saw on the self service portal. I'm going to stick with the home working service just because that's the one we, we went through as the end user. Uh, and this is where it all comes together. So this is the service configuration, and it's probably the kind of standard stuff you'd expect to see in a service configuration uh, tool, part of the tool. Um, this particular service is in the catalog status. You can see the SLA details there. In the bottom right, we have the subscriptions to this particular service. So in this case, there are three named users, but it could be uh, an entire company. It could be a spe specific department. It could be internal, external, uh, a specific user, um, or everybody in, in the customer database. completely up to you who you want to be able to consume from that service. Uh, the supporting teams is a slight difference in architecture to support works in that only these teams are enabled to see anything related to this particular service so unlike support works we have to filter everything back uh, this supporting team functionality provides an automatic partition uh, so it's very easy to have HR and facilities and finance uh, even with sensitive data all on the same system and there's no consultancy required to set that up it should be nice and easy just to drop these in here and only these teams will be able to see anything to do with this particular service uh, we have a few more actions at the top. Again, we can keep it completely private. So an HR service, for example, then nobody else in the system will be able to see that. Is it visible on the portal? And obviously this current status of this particular service. The request configuration tab, as you can see, is split out into the different call classes. And then per call class, we can have the, the various catalog items. Uh, this particular catalog item um, is asking this particular set of questions and this fulfillment process. Obviously, that's your fulfillment process, whatever process you want to kick off, and whichever questions you need to be able to, uh, to to be answered to be able to deal with that particular request. The icon, and then whether it's visible just for the analysts or just for the customers or both. And if there were languages in your organization, you want to translate this into, let's go with uh, Portuguese. Uh, Ronaldo won. Ballon d'Or last night, so it's only appropriate. So if I want to see that in Portuguese, I don't know Portuguese, but I can click that button, and there it is. Uh, I trust that's correct. Uh, the last bit on here is the customer feedback directly beneath. So once the ticket gets resolved against this particular process, against this call class, we can ask uh, the customer on the self-service portal, are you happy with how long it took to respond to this request? How would you rate the support? Uh, please share any ideas on how we how we can improve. So there's different types of questions. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are not, and it expires in a year's time. Uh, we've also got a star rating there, and obviously once all of this has been gathered, it can all be reported on. Uh, just to show you the difference, so that's for incidents. For service requests, it's slightly different. We have two catalog items, and we've only got the star rating enabled for the feedback. So moving along, any active requests against this service shown under the request tab. Any assets that may underpin this service are shown under the Assets tab. Any FAQs uh, that have been, pu been published to the self-service, how many times it's been liked, disliked, and viewed. The bulletins that are flashing across the top of the self-service. And finally, the SLAs that are linked to this particular service. The last icon on here is the Configuration Explorer icon. And you'll see this icon across uh, pretty much well, quite a few records within the system. Uh, but what this will do is show the user the relationships between the record that we're looking at and the rest of the system. So you can see from that particular service, there are lots of requests, and there are a couple of assets there, and those are the ones that underpin this particular service. So this is automatically generated. Uh, if I want to clear down the noise and get rid of the requests, I can just click this button at the top, and that will shrink that to only show me the assets that are linked to this particular service, so I can see the impact. So that service depends on that particular asset and that particular asset, but if I want to see what else is depending on that particular asset I can expand from there and see okay that is installed on those two laptops uh, and, and Graham is also linked to that particular uh, CI somehow as well so it's just a, a, a visual representation of the dependencies across the system uh, and as I say in, in the type of uh, in the case of requests and documents and things like that it's automatically generated services uh, but the assets can also be imported as well, uh, the relationships between those for, for impact analysis. Um, this is currently set to only three levels, but it can go to as many levels as you want to. Um, so the next part, I'm going to jump across to the 
admin portal. I'm going to click in to, well, there's, there's two sides of the things that I want to show you. Firstly, the processes. The second is the progressive capture. Uh, the process is the film process get kicked, that get kicked off when a ticket gets logged against that particular process. So catalog item in this case. Um, I'm going to start with a, a desktop incident process. So probably the best thing about this is it's non-prescriptive. Um, with support works, for example, you have to have a response timer and a fixed timer against every process, uh, against every ticket that, that gets logged regardless of process. Um, you have to send an email when an action happens. Um, it's, it's rigid, I suppose, in comparison to this. Uh, everything is graphical in this case. Everything's drag and drop. So at that particular point, if I wanted an authorization, it's as simple as that. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's non-prescriptive. So in this particular case, each blue node is an automated task. Uh, an email gets sent, it gets assigned to a particular team, it checks is there a priority on the ticket, if there is, then it starts the fixed time, there's no response timer in this case, if not, we we'll wait for an analyst to pick up the ticket, wait for an analyst to provide a priority, and that's when the timer starts. So as I say, it doesn't need to start as soon as the ticket's logged, it's completely up to you how you want that to work. The benefit for you is you can make the system work the way you want to work, you're not tied into the way the system works. Um, and obviously these processes, as you can see, there's three stages in this case. You can make them as complex or as simple as you want. Uh, obviously they'll be kicked off per catalog item, so you can make them as very concise. Uh, just to show you an example of what it's capable of though, if I go back to the change process in particular, uh, there are four stages of this process. But in the second stage, there is an impact assessment. That's a human task, these gray ones. Uh, we have completely definable outcomes. So in this case, there's high, medium, or low outcomes. If it's high or medium, we need a backout plan, and then it will go down, gather some more change details, and go down to authorization. Whereas if it's low, it will skip the backout plan and go straight down to authorization. The authorization in this case takes the form of three named users. This could be the cab, uh, each with 100% waiting. So whoever gets there first will authorize a request against this particular service. We can have this particular task expiring uh, due after a particular date and time or expiring after a particular date and time. We can pass variables through to this particular authorization task. So potentially someone who doesn't manage tickets on a day-to-day -day basis will have or can be given the information they need to be able to make an informed decision without uh, having to look at the actual request itself. So potentially a CEO could be on the golf course and still authorize a request on his phone. Um, as I mentioned, that particular authorization could expire. If it gets approved, it will go down, mark is approved and push to the next stage. If it gets rejected, it will be asked, is this a valid reje rejection and potentially resubmitted? But if it expires, the authorization can be delegated to that person's manager, whoever's specified in that particular node there. So as I say, the processes are capable of many, many things. It's completely up to you how you want those to work. Uh, and as Manish will mention, all of this will be... Uh, will help you build your process as part of the 30-day switcher. Uh, so the second side of it is obviously gathering the information to be able to work on that particular request. So for a VPN access issue, you know the details that you will, be, you will need to gather to be able to work on that particular request. So Progressive Capture is the engine that we use to gather that information. And a good example is the new request progressive capture. Uh, these are like the self-service wizards in support works. It's a decision-based system and the user will only ever see what they need to see based on their previous answer. So in this case, you can see dependence on the customer. It will check is it uh, internal, is it external, and then dependent on the particular service that the customer is selecting, it will go down, potentially switch processes, potentially log uh, ask for attachments, potentially ask for categories, priorities, assets. Um, well, obviously, all of this complexity is hidden from the end users and the analysts. It's, exact, it's exactly the same engine for the analysts as it is for the end users. Um, obviously, another benefit over the self-service wizard and support works is that it's graphical. It's all drag and drop again. Um, so completely up to you where you want that to work and how you, where you want the particular questions to, to be. So how does all of this look in action? If I flip across the request list first of all, uh, these are Graham's incidents. So Graham has all of these call classes and if Graham didn't have the right to see service requests, for example, he wouldn't see the icon at all. Nothing's ever grayed out or unclickable. So if I click on, these are all Graham's requests, regardless of call class, you can see they're all mixed in there. Graham may be a member of different teams. 
So if I want to see all the changes in the change team, I click on change management and there they are. Or if I want to see all of the tickets in all of Graham's teams, there's some standard out of the box filters here. Uh, click on all my teams and there they are. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this case, we have 138 requests. So there's lots of information. We have a quick filter in the top left. So I can quickly type in VPN and that will respond with all the VPN related tickets that we can search on all of this data. So if I want to find all the data where Brian is the owner, let's say, I'll type in Brian. And there are all the Brian's tickets. Or if I want to find where Anna is the customer, again, I can type in Anna. And there they are. So that's a quick filter to quickly sort through lots of information. But there may be a need for a more permanent view. So we have this views drop down in the top right. And high priority incidents, for example. So we can quickly click on that. And there are all the tickets where the priority is high. But in support works, you might need to know a bit about the database. You might need to know where to go to set that kind of view up. So we try to take that complexity away with this system. And we have this simple clause builder. So priority is high. Request type is instant. Status is open. If I wanted to add in a condition, say where the owner is Graham, so owner is Graham, it's as simple as that uh, and just as easy to remove. So each analyst can set up their own views. Uh, there's no need for any technical knowledge. It's as simple as that. As long as the analyst knows which view they want to see, they can set it up. Um, you can potentially share that view as well. So this particular view has been shared with the first line support team. We share that with a specific user or the people who support a particular service. We might also want to see that same information, as you can see in the background there, represented in a different way. And in this case, we split it up so we can see those tickets where they're set by team, uh, who owns those active high priority incidents, and we've also got one where they originate from by site. So you can have many different views, which will mean many different charts. And what that will give you is a button in the top right to see the same information that we're seeing on the request list here, but in a graphical way. So these are the personal dashboards. Each analyst can have their own dashboards, which will mean each analyst can set it up the way they want to. So we can drag and drop. We can make it bigger or smaller. And most importantly, we can click into them. As you can see, I, I did that a bit quickly. I actually clicked. Apologies. I'll go back. So if you want to see the tickets that are currently in the second line, the active high priority inc incidents in the second line, I'll click on those, and there they are. At any point, we can export the data. We can choose the columns that we want to add, and that will export it straight into CSV. Uh, we can refresh the list. We can flip back to our home view, or if we're particularly taken on the view we're looking at, we can set that as our home view. Obviously, this is individual to each analyst, so it's completely up to everyone how they want it to, to work and look. All of the columns, very similar support works, we can click on and sort on. And if we want to add or remove columns, we can simply click on the column in the top right. And all of these, let's say we want to see resolved by, we click on that and we now see that. We want to see that second, we can simply drag it into second. So nice and easy, uh, no technical knowledge required. It's uh, just click and drag, quite simply. We can even distinguish between the columns that we want to see on a phone or a tablet. So let's say I want to see that second now, but I don't want to see that on a small screen. Save that, and there it is. It's as simple as that. So the actual logging of a ticket, if we want to log an incident, we can. But a common piece of feedback we heard from support works was that when, it, when let's say, Steve is on the phone right now, we don't know what Steve is calling about. So we can open an incident form, fill in Steve's details, find out what Steve's calling about, and at that point we realize actually it's not an incident, it's a request. So we do copy the details out. Do we ask Steve to repeat himself? It's a, a, a common piece of feedback. So we've got this raise new button to try and address that particular piece of feedback. Uh, so if Steve is on the phone right now, then click the raise new button. We have no idea what Steve is calling about. We don't even know who it is. Who's calling it, Steve? Are we talking to the right Steve? Yes. Are you calling him out an active request, Steve? If so, here's an update. If not, we hit next. These are the services that Steve is currently subscribed to. So if he was calling about something to do with a Mac, uh, we can click on the relevant catalog item and that will go and ask its own set of questions and kick off its own fulfillment process. Uh, in this case, I'm going to stick with the desktop support service. Uh, so what are you calling about, Steve? I've got a VPN issue. VPN issue. So one question at a time, and then we come, we've got, we know who's calling, we know the service is calling about, we know what he's calling about. So at that point, we then have enough information to say, actually, this is an incident or no, this is a change request, let's say. 
So if I say that's a change and hit next, we're asked to upload a document. And as I mentioned, we can hit the previous button or we can flip back on the uh, breadcrumb trail on the right hand side. And we say, actually, no, this is an incident. So because we've now selected an incident, we're asked a different set of questions. It's a category in this case. It's a VPN access issue. Uh, the priority is, it's only Steve, it's low. Uh, the assets that are linked directly to Steve, and as I mentioned, we can search through the entire CMDB to find a shared asset that wouldn't be linked directly to Steve. Uh, in this case, as I say, it could be something to do with his laptop. So I'll leave it at like that, and I'll hit finish. And it will come back with another reference number. And again, we've prefixed that with IN for incident, but you can prefix that with whatever you want. So we'll have a look at the ticket that we've just logged. And we can see we've sent an email. We've already assigned it to the first line support team. And the, prior, the priority has already been set. And that target uh, resolution time is ongoing now. Uh, the only thing we haven't done in that first stage is allocate an analyst. Uh, so the system is actually prompting whoever opens this ticket first to assign an, either themselves or another member of the first line support team. So I'm logged on as Graham. And as you can see, Graham is currently online. But you can see everybody else in the team is, is offline. Uh, Brian is actually on holiday. So because I'm the only person in, I will pick it up as Graham. And because we've done that, that checkpoint has been ticked. We moved on to the second stage to resolve this particular desktop issue. We've been assigned a task to do that, uh, to, to resolve the desktop issue, obviously. Uh, so all of that was pretty much automatic. Uh, unfortunately, there is still some kind of manual input. So if I wanted to update the tickets, you have the update box in the top left. Uh, click update, and that will go into the timeline again in chronological order. Uh, very similar to the live chat. If Graham wanted to pass Steve a screenshot, he can paste that straight in and type in there, this is what I'm seeing, Steve. Are you seeing the same thing? So Steve can then pick that up on the portal or his mobile or wherever he might be looking at the ticket. Uh, there are lots of other things that we can do across the top here. Uh, before I get onto that, we can also use um, custom buttons to pass variables from the record we're looking at through to a resource like Google, for example. So the details for this, this is a VPN issue. So if I click that Google button, it will go away and search Google for VPN issue. So I'm going to say, okay, Steve, try that. That might solve your problem. People nowadays might prefer to watch a video rather than read a long PDF or a long set of instructions. So again, I can click on the YouTube button. And that will go away, play a video on, on YouTube or search YouTube for a particular uh, subject area. We can take the abbreviated URL across the bottom or the long one across the top. And just like the image, we can paste that straight in and say, okay, Steve, watch this video. I think this will solve your problem. Uh, we can also search through our internal workspaces just to see if this come up before or if there's any knowledge on the uh, workspaces that might help this particular case. Uh, so as I mentioned, lots of other options across the top. We can attach files, we can link requests, we can send emails, uh, we can assign, add in connections, escalate, look at the assets, look at the boards, which I'll come back to in a bit more detail later, uh, resolve, cancel, and then that configuration explorer so we can see the relationships across the system for this particular record, and print. So lots and lots of options across the top. You can enable, disable each of these per call class, per service, if you want to. Uh, coming down the right-hand side, I mentioned the tasks. This particular task, it, this has been predefined by the process, but it could be going to a different user, a different team. If I edit this, just to show you what's available, we can assign it to say to another user, role, or group. Uh, it's due by a particular date and time. We can attach a file, or we can add a checklist. So if this was going to... Uh, the networks team and it was due by this particular date and time we could say okay guys you need to do one and you need to do two save that they can then pick that up on the phones or within the system however they want to see that then come in and say right we've done one of these two things and uh, because we're only halfway through an automatic progress bar has been generated against that task so again graham can just at a glance see how far through the networks team are with that particular task rather than having to chase them for an update uh, we can add tasks on the fly as well. Um, so we can create a task and assign that if you want someone else's input. We can assign the overall ticket across as well. But we've complemented both of those with the concept of being able to drop in a subject matter expert. So Graham, in this case, we know there's a known issue. We can ask Rosemary, who is the change manager. Uh, Rosemary, have you seen anything 
about this particular type of issue. Uh, Rosemary normally only works with changes because she's the change manager, so normally doesn't have the rights to see incidents. But because Graham has added Rosemary in as a member, her rights have been elevated so she can see this particular record. She'll get a notification in a notifications list or on a phone, wherever she chooses to get the notification, and she'll be able to jump in and see this without messing around with rights. Uh, her rights have been automatically elevated so she can see this particular ticket. Uh, Graham can then tag Rosemary. Hey, Rosemary, can you look at this? And again, Rosemary will get a notification. She'll come in, comment like, yep, I've seen this is going on, or there's a change in play for this, or no, please raise a change. So if Graham needs to raise a change off the back of that, as I mentioned, we can link requests. So first of all, we can search for a request within a request. So this is a VPN access issue. We can type in VPN, search there, and there are lots of VPN related tickets, four pages worth, in fact, 33 in total. So I can filter that back based on the type. So I'm looking for that particular problem. Uh, the status, it's an open problem, and the service if we want to as well. So if I search again, there's one open problem relating to VPN. So I'll link that. And now the collapsible panel has appeared, again, all in the one page, no flicking between tabs or anything like that. Um, if we still need to, so we've linked the problem. Because we've linked the problem, this solution icon has now appeared at the top as well. And that will provide the workaround that was available against that problem, again, just to help the analyst. This is a workaround for this problem. Does this work? And the analyst can say, yep, yeah, that's the solution, or no, that's not quite for us. And as I mentioned, if Rosemary's asked Graham to raise a change, we can, from within the ticket, you can pass variables through. Uh, presented with the service list again, I'm going to keep with the desktop support just to uh, keep it consistent. Uh, it's a different set of questions because this is a change now. So it's a standard change, it's user specific, and it's a uh, low risk. Uh, but I'll be worried about the assets for this particular case. And again, we've prefixed this CH. Uh, this change with CH and we've got a new reference number but again it's completely up to you how you want that to work so going into the change now we'd had a quick look at the change process on this uh, on this particular uh, example and again it's been assigned to the change team but we haven't allocated our list Graham is a member of the change team so I'll pick it up as Graham and there's a couple of things towards the end here I want to show you so I'm going to flick through a few of these tasks is this a valid change yes it is uh, we can color code the options as well. We can make the uh, the text mandatory or not as well. So on the second stage, we have an impact assessment. So if you remember on the uh, the change process we looked at, if it's high or medium, we need a backup plan. But if it's low, we can go straight through to uh, the authorization. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to select low. That's been ticked. We now have the authorization tasks. So we've skipped that middle stage there, the backup plan. Now, we have three named users, so Brian, Graham, and Daniel. I can't, or it's, it's a named uh, right, so I can't click on Daniel's authorization. I have to click on my own. Uh, luckily, Graham is a member of the cab, so he can. So I will say that one is good to go. Accept that particular authorization. And again, the approval checkpoint has been ticked. We're now on the th third stage to schedule this change in. Um, so we do have the scheduling option at the top here as well. So we can say, okay, this needs to run from next Monday to next Friday, let's say. Schedule that in. Again, the checkpoint has been ticked. And we now have a task to actually implement this change. So there's a few things that are happening here in the background. Uh, the number one is the change calendar. So it's a full schedule change, so anybody with the rights can come in and see exactly what's going on in the change world uh, in this particular service desk. We also have these visual boards. Now, these are a new addition, and what this will do is give uh, the viewer a bird's eye view of any particular area of the business. So in this case, this is the change management board. Uh, so Rosemary, for example, being the change manager, there are many changes in flight, and Rosemary being the manager needs to be responsible for all of them. So rather than looking at them as a list, this is a bird's eye view to see the current state of play of all the changes that are currently in flight. So they're all listed per stage of the process. Um, you can drag and drop all of these. So I can drag and drop that one, for example. But we recommend that you let the process take care of it for you. So the change that we've just raised, we've just raised from an incident, 
it went through authorization, it got approved, and it got scheduled in. So that change is this one is already over here, which has been automatically pushed there by the process. So when Rosemary comes in, she'll get an up-to-date uh, representation of where all the changes are. We can even see the owners. So Graham is at the top there. If I click on Graham, that will limit the view to just Graham's requests on this particular board. Uh, the change board is just an example. Another good example is the breach board. So it's more for a service desk manager. Let's say they want to see which tickets are about to breach, which tickets have breached. Uh, the ones that are breaching in 30 minutes, the ones that have breached. So in this case, that person, Daniel, has got one that's breached and one that's about to breach. So we can say, okay, Daniel, what's going on? We can click into all of these if we want to uh, to see the finer details. Uh, so these are just a couple of examples of the boards. We've got procurement, we've got problem, we've got release management. Uh, lots of different examples. We use it for development, obviously. Uh, but there's lots of things that you can do with those boards. You can share all of these boards with uh, various teams and uh, specific users as well if you want to. Now I'm going to come back to the, the news feed. So this is the home view. This is what people will see when they first log in. And as I say, each analyst may see a completely different view depending on what they're interested in. So firstly, the change that we've just approved, again, we can push this out to the workspace. Oops. So it's pushed out to that particular change management workspace. So whoever is a member of that workspace will have that automatically updated on their news feed. Again, all chronological order. But Rosemary, for example, if she logs in now, she can see that particular change has just been approved. She can click straight into the change. Or, as I say, in this case, we can update that change as part of that process. So that particular change has been successfully implemented and the change review has been completed. There's no further action required for that. So basically what's happening is the information that the logged in user is interested in is coming to the logged in user. So Rosemary, as I say, if she logs in, she doesn't need to go looking for that. That is coming to her. Uh, and basically this news feed is an amalgamation of all the bits and pieces that the logged in user is interested in. So documents, uh, changes, major incidents. Uh, Graham is following this particular incident. So this would be like the watch calls view in support works. Uh, Graham is not the customer, he's not the owner. But because he clicked this follow button, any update to this request will be pushed to Graham's news feed. So it's as simple as that. Just click follow or unfollow. Uh, so as I mentioned, all of the topics on the newsfeed are broken out into workspaces. These are basically categories for that particular uh, subject. Uh, so each analyst can join the one they want to join. So first line FAQ is a good example. James, who is in the first line support team, has a question. He's got a, an error message from his customer. He's posted the image and he's asked on the workspace, can anybody help? What's going on? Uh, two people in this case have uh, responded. Pierre and Pablo, and both, as I mentioned, are using different languages, but that doesn't make a difference for us. We can always work in the language we are uh, we want to work in. So there are two responses. So James has a choice. These are both subject matter experts, but four people have validated Pablo's answer. So James will probably try Pablo's first. Most importantly, in a year's time, if someone has the exact same issue, they can search the workspaces using the global search at the top, find this post, and that will work again. So the ideal situation would be Pablo has put that answer out. He doesn't need to be uh, constantly repeating the same information over and over again. Uh, just to show you an example, if I take Truth or VPN, copy that, put that into the global search at the top, and search. We have uh, lots of results for Truth or VPN. So I can filter that back based on the date it was posted, who posted it. Uh, what type of post it was and the workspace it was posted in. So I've just copied that from the first line FAQs. So I'll search again. That's the post we've just copied it from. So as I mentioned, that information with this forum asking uh, and answering type format is there forevermore. The flip side is uh, an area for more structured knowledge, which is uh, what we call document manager. So the thing this is trying to address are all of those uh, network shares with the dodgy naming conventions. You're not quite sure if that's the latest version of that particular document. Uh, because it's all in the central place, it, you, you can guarantee, you can see exactly what's happened on each of the documents, but you can guarantee that is the latest and greatest. Uh, all of the documents we can sort into different libraries of collections. So we can share the marketing documents with the marketing team, for example. Um, if I click into one of these documents, the change management process, this is a Word document. You can see this document is due for review. So we'll get a notification, uh, which actually is quite a while ago now. 
Uh, we can share it with particular users. We can give each user uh, particular rights. And as I mentioned, we've got the timeline so we can see everything that's happened, when it happened, and who it, who did that action. Uh, we can keep different versions of the document, and we can open each version and then publish the one that we want to publish when we're ready. We can keep tasks against the documents. We can keep tags against the documents. And these tags, once we're in there, we can then search for these tags. So change management process, there's our document. But we've also got a graphical view, uh, which we call a tag cloud. So this will collate all of the tags in your document manager and show them in this graphical format. And the ones that are used most are shown the biggest. So our change management process, for example, is it's only used once. So if I click into that, there's our document again. So as I say, this is more of an area for structured knowledge. Um, there are lots of other applications on the right-hand side there again. Uh, all of which, if you have a chat with your relationship manager, we'll be more than happy to go through with you in a bit more detail. Uh, but the last thing I want to show you is the reporting side of things. So we've got three levels of reporting. We've got the personal dashboards, which I showed you. We have the kind of standard reporting suite. But we've also got this advanced analytics, which is uh, new for service manager. And the advanced analytics takes the form of, well, there's four different parts, basically. Uh, the first one is the trending engine. We set a target. We well, we, we set up a, uh, a measure, basically an area that we want to uh, understand the, the trend of how we're doing. So incidents closed per month, incidents logged per month, incidents resolved daily, for example. We set a target of how we want to perform against that particular measure. And this will go away every day, week, month, year, and gather the data against your particular measure. Uh, we've also got a spark line, so we can see how we, we're going against that particular measure as well. Once we've got your measures, you can then put them onto a widget. And a widget is a bit of information, and we can take many different types. Uh, if I just let's take that one, for example, so this is a list. Uh, and if I compare that with a annual comparison of monthly tickets raised, and that's a chart. So all of these we can put together based on a, a measure or not. It's completely up to you how you want to see those. And once we've got our widgets, we can then put them onto a dashboard. So service desk overview, for example. So as you can see, there's lots of different uh, widgets on this particular dashboard. And this could be above the service desk on a screen. It could be the base of a meeting. Or it can form uh, the latest and greatest data. We can grant access to a particular user or team or group. And those users will be able to log in uh, whenever they want to. It's just a URL and see the latest and greatest up-to-date information rather than waiting for a report uh, that will be scheduled and emailed to them. And then the last bit there is a slideshow. So again, once we've got many dashboards, we can put them onto a slideshow. And again, this can flick around as base of a meeting or above the service desk. And that will flick around every five to 10 seconds accordingly. Each one potentially showing different data. Uh, and obviously, all of these configurable. It's up to you how you want to see these. Uh, that's everything from me. Any questions, please put them into the chat session. And I'm going to hand you back to Manish. Thank you very much, Connor. That was a great demo. Just a reminder, as Connor said, please do continue to ask your questions. We've received a number of them so far. And we'll come to them at the end of the session. So just to close up now, we're going to, I'm going to look at our commercial offering, some of Hornbill's key differentiators, and our support works to service manager migration package. Firstly, I'd like to share our core values as a company with you. Customer first, we're committed to working with our customers and being responsive to your needs. Partnership through collaboration. We work in partnership with our customers and we value the feedback that you give us, whether it's through your relationship managers, our user groups, or our forums, or any other interactions. Quality, not compromise. We aim to be world-class in everything we do, whether it's our people, our processes, or our technology. And for the reason of quality, not compromise, we actually offer no fixed-term contract for Hornbill Service Manager. Uh, and I'll come on to that in more detail later. So we want you to be 100% satisfied that this system is right for you whether it's your reporting requirements, your business process requirements, whatever it may be. And for that reason, we offer a 100% risk-free 30-day satisfaction guarantee. It's something quite different from any other vendors in our marketplace. What it means is you put us to the test. We'll give you your own instance of Hornbill Service Manager. You can try it out in your own environment, with your own data, with your own integrations. We'll assign a product specialist to you who will work with you to configure the system your way. 
Your product specialist will train you up and give you the knowledge and expertise you need to manage the system going forward. And at the end of the 30 days, the choice is yours. You can either start subscribing or walk away without any obligation. The reason we offer this is so that you, our customer, can make an informed decision about whether this system is right for you and really remove any risk from yourselves. So how does Hornbill stand out from the crowd? First and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, this is a true service, not a traditional piece of software. So what that means is all of the updates are automatic, customizations keep working after an update, you're always up to date with the latest features and there is no service disruption. You concentrate on service delivery, let Hornbill take care of the rest. Price for Life is a guarantee we offer whereby the pricing level you sign up to will stay the same for the entire length of time you're a customer. So if Hornbill raise our prices, you will not be affected. Better still, you'll get automatic discounts over time through the effect of inflation. You'll also continue getting more value from our solution as we add more features and functionality to our platform, which you'll continue to benefit from without paying anything extra. Train for Life is another guarantee we offer, whereby Hornbill will train Yop your solution champion as part of our free implementation, as I mentioned earlier. But if they leave, if they're replaced, if they're promoted, they retire, whatever it may be, we'll train up the replacement free of charge. And we'll continue to do this for the entire length of time you're a customer. And this will avoid the situation I mentioned earlier, when, whereby your administrator or solution champion leaves the organization and leaves a gap in knowledge on your service desk. And no contract tie-in. I mentioned earlier, one of our core values is quality, not compromise. And for that reason, we offer a simple rolling contract that can be terminated at any time for any reason, because we want happy customers, not contractually bound customers. Customers often ask me why we offer this, and it's quite simple. It forces Hornbill to offer a great value, quality service, otherwise our customers could simply leave us. So how much does it cost? We offer a simple, scalable pricing model, which starts at £42.50 per user per month for a minimum of 10 users. There's a volume discount, so the more users you have, the lower the unit cost. Here's just a selection of some of our customers that have migrated over to Service Manager. As you can see, they come from a variety of sectors and industries. Two that I'd like to mention in particular. Firstly, Ellsbury Vale District Council, who moved over from Support Works to Service Manager back in 2015. Uh, this was part of their drive to move to an infrastructure-free environment. They actually won the Best Small Service Desk Award using Service Manager at the uh, SDI event back in April 2016. IDOCS also moved from Support Works to Service Manager in 2015. Uh, they supply uh, software and services to the UK public sector. One of their key concerns was the transfer of historical call data to Service Manager from Support Works, and we actually moved over 10,000 records for them over a course of a weekend. So just to wrap up now, as a Support Works customer, we'll go over and beyond the free of charge implementation and 30-day trial that I mentioned earlier. We'll actually migrate any call data over from Support Works to Service Manager if you wish, completely free of charge. We'll also offer a credit of any unused support and maintenance from Support Works once you start subscribing to Service Manager. You qualify as long as you're an existing customer with an active contract. If you do wish to move forward or you are interested in this, please do let your relationship manager know as soon as possible. We are experiencing extreme, extremely high demand, particularly for the start of next year. Uh, so there is limited availability, so do move forward as soon as possible if you are interested. It's also worth noting we are considering phasing out the free of my free of charge migration service that we've been offering. So as I say, please do move forward as soon as possible to avoid disappointment. Okay, so thank you very much for your time today, everyone. Um, we've received a few questions, which we will come on to now. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you very much. There are quite a few CI related questions. So I don't really talk about the CIs that much, but yes, we can schedule an import from a system management tool, whatever that might be, SCCM or Centennial or Sotero or Zenworks or whatever the case may be. Um, I'll just put it up here as well. Uh, so, right, so I'll, I'll start from the top. Um, these can be set up automatically to, to automatically fire across to your system. Uh, basically, there's an import script that will sit on your server, gather the information from the relevant database, encrypt the data, and fire it across to your uh, instance on the cloud. Um, I can see 
Uh, one particular customer is asking about the staging area that's, that's there in SupportWorks. No, there is no staging area in Service Manager. Uh, it looks like you'll be pleased to hear. Um, we can automatically link certain assets to a specific person as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's more streamlined. Um, we can designate a primary and secondary column when sorting calls. Uh, you can sort by escalation uh, and then secondly, be oh, okay, by fixed by no. It, it's simply you've got all the columns there that you want to see and then you just click on the relevant column that you want. So you can't say this first, then that, and then obviously the relevant order. It will just go by the one that you click on. So you can have them first and second, uh, but it'll be the one that you click on that will be ordered by. And then um, can a specific user change their main language? We have absolutely no problem at all. So, uh, yeah, we have some German users which need everything to be in their language. That's absolutely fine. That's all out of the box. Um, I showed you briefly a couple of the catalog items. You can type that out in English and there'll be a button there to change it into German. But, yes, the, the point being every user, regardless of where they come from, will be able to work in their own language uh, the entire way through the system. That's absolutely fine. Um, so, yes, uh, assets can be imported uh, automatically and languages are absolutely fine as well and obviously the columns uh, can be sorted there as well uh, so lots and lots of questions um, where is our data held uh, Manish do you want to take that one yes yeah, so your data will be held in the geographical location where you're located so if you're in Europe your data will be held in Europe if you're in North America it will be located in North America um, if you're in the U um, our European data center is actually located in the UK a um, couple of other questions. Do I have to migrate my call data over from SupportWorks to Service Manager? Um, in answer to that question, no, you don't. It's completely up to yourself. If you wish to, that's absolutely fine, and we'll offer that free of charge at the moment. However, many customers do choose to make a fresh start, so you, had, you do have that option. Um, got another question here. Is there a minimum number of subscriptions required to sign up? There is a minimum of 10 users uh, which are required to sign up. And last question here, we'd be interested in undertaking a migration next month, but you mentioned high demand. How do I secure a migration slot? Um, yes, there is very high demand, particularly for next year. Uh, to secure the migration slot, please do contact your relationship manager. There's some paperwork and some details that we'll need to discuss, um, and we'll just need you to confirm that you're happy to proceed um, against our terms of service, and then we can take it from there. So that's all the questions answered. Um, I'll pass you over to Sarah. Thank you, Manish and Connor, for taking us through that presentation. I hope everyone found it useful. If you have any additional questions, please don't he hesitate to contact me or your relationship manager. Finally, thank you everyone for your time today. Goodbye.